we were just wanting to share a little bit about what we went through to try and pull this story off or whatever. And, and I, I love the idea of um, you know getting together as professionals and sharing tips on how we do things and stuff because you know different people have different skills in this room and we can all learn from each other. And I think that's really important. Um, the idea for this story came from, um, well, I think a lot of people had the idea for this story. Um, it was pretty evident from the beginning that Plaza Towers to us seemed to be the most compelling story because it involved the death of children. And while there were a lot of tragic events that happened during this tornado, I think that's one that just strikes at a chord for people. So I think we knew early on, sort of from different approaches, that we wanted to tell that story. And um, I know Carrie and um, was given an assignment early on to go and try and tell the story of Plaza Towers, which is a pretty ambitious assignment. You know, how do you, how do you tell the story of a 50-year-old school, right? And um, so p part of the initial thing was, how do we tell it? What, what is the framework that we want to tell this story from? What, you know, that f for us, narrowing the focus early was really important because when you narrow the focus on something, it helps you with your reporting. You know, you know that you're aiming towards a point and, and that the superfluous stuff you can sort of let go. Um, but we had a ton of information with this story. There had been tons of interviews that had been done, on-camera interviews, um, stuff that we didn't want to lose. And so we sort of ended up knowing that we needed to tell two stories in a way. Um, it was all, it was everybody's story about that day and, and where they were and, and uh, what, the, what the tornado and the effect had been on them. But we knew that for our, our written story in the paper, we needed, we needed to narrow that even further. And that's when we sort of hit on the idea, what happened in that hallway? What happened in the place where the people died? And so for us, that sort of, I think, helped a lot. Because from that point on, we knew, OK, yeah, there's a lot of other great stories that happened that day. There was a lot of heroism that happened all over that place. But if it didn't affect that hallway, let's not worry about it. Just tell me what happened in that hallway. And then it became pretty easy, which was, we need to track down the people that were in the hallway and get them to tell us the story as best they can. And I think for, for us, the thing that really helped was having Jennifer Doan, who hadn't told her story really to anybody yet, really tell it in detail for us. And the first thing that we did then was we just laid her story out in, in a timeline. Um, and that, that became our framework. She put us in places in time over the course of that day that sort of pr provided anchors for us that we then tried to build detail around. And you know, for me, that meant going out like the, to the National Weather Service website and just finding out like concrete times of things that we could stick in that story that we knew had happened at an exact moment. We knew in the radar, we knew in the National Weather Service issued the bulletin to the minute, to the second we knew it. We knew what time the sirens came on. Um, we knew what time they told people to take shelter. I mean, that helped us. They were concrete events that we could plant in the story. And they just became paragraphs. But yet it was something that we, it was an actual event that we knew that, could, that happened. And I don't want to dominate this, but one of the early, one of the early things that we, that we encountered, of course, is you're dealing with a catastrophe. And people's memories in catastrophes are imperfect and they don't recall events the same way. They can, be in the, they can be in the same conversation and recall it differently. They can hear the same message over the intercom and hear something completely different. And so that was something we sort of struggled with. And that became sort of an issue of writing around it. Or if we couldn't, if there wasn't some proof of it, or if somebody didn't hear it the same way, it was kind of like, eh, we, better, we better couch this somehow. So that was part of it. What was concrete? What was true? What did we know had actually happened? And did we know it had happened at a specific time? And that's just kind of how we started. And I'll, I'll pass it off just to. Uh, I'll uh, give a couple of ex uh, an example or two of what uh, Phil was talking about. 
there, there was uh, a, a teacher named Cheryl Littlejohn who was uh, in the hallway, and she's a third grade teacher, and she was watching uh, through the window f for the tornado. And uh, Jennifer Doan said that, uh, that she came out and she was, she kind of spoke quietly so as not to uh, uh, dis uh, disturb or upset the children who, who were, the, this, this whole image of the children wind up in the hallway on their hands and knees facing the walls is, is, is just amazing to me. It's a really powerful image. Um, but uh, a teacher's aide who was in the hall recalled that Cheryl Littlejohn came through the door and slammed the door behind her and said, uh, I believe it was, it's here. Uh, and we talked about that and, and the differences in their recollections of that one particular, you know, really small event. But it, but it was an important event because the, uh, there was a line of trees uh, along the creek behind the school and Mrs. Littlejohn had said when, I'll come let you know when the tornado hits the tree line. And then she, you know, she came through the door and then the memories differ about uh, how exactly she told them but the, the message was still the same. It's here and, and this is it, you know, and, and there's, at that point, I was really struck by the, the heroism and the bravery of the people, the, the parents who were, not the parents, but the teachers who were there, uh, because there was nothing they could do. They were just helpless at that moment, and they had no idea what it was going to do to the building. They had no idea what it was going to do to them or their children, uh, and, and, and they just, uh, they did all that they could do to protect the lives of the children uh, who they were caring for that day. Um, um, I just wanted to say that this was the pro the largest project that I've ever worked on as far as like the vast amount of information. Um, it was it was it was sort of a difficult transition switching from you know disaster mode coverage to project mode coverage because you know in the beginning it was well tell the story of the school. And well, how are we going to do that? You know, by five. Um, that's a large order, um, and you know, it's a little crazy out there right now. Um, so it, we basically were just gathering as much as we could, not exactly knowing what the project would be, not knowing what direction it would take, just gathering, gathering, gathering. And so the result was we had interviews with dozens of people, not really knowing exactly what the end product would be. And so when we decided to, you know, like Phil was talking about zeroing in on the hallway and zeroing in on the, that big long TikTok, what we had didn't necessarily fit with that. You know, there were key characters that we needed to go back and interview, which was difficult, you know, because you've already talked to them and you've already, so you have to go back and say, can we please talk about the worst thing that's ever happened to you again? You know, and that's hard. Um, but it was necessary, and so it was important for us to really only, only do that for the people that we really truly needed to. You know, not everybody we talked to, even, even people that we, you know, I mean, you have to really realize who's primary and who's secondary. And um, the the online the online project was really a venue for all of those for all the rest of that information that we had been gathering, so that it wouldn't just be wasted, so there wouldn't just be for nothing and that all those people's stories mattered and that people did want to read them, but it just didn't fit into the print product exactly for this particular thing. Because, you know, when we were writing for just this hallway, we started with 500 inches, just with eight people, I guess we had, 500 inches. Like, that is crazy town. Um, and so we narrowed it to 220-ish. And that, I mean, and that's not counting 40 additional interviews that we had online. I mean, that's just a, a glut of information that something had to be done with it, you know, and it's just, and it would be a waste just to say, well, that's not, it's, you know, we can't just throw it away and say we're not going to do anything with it. We have to do something with it. And so that was a good, I think that we did a good job of, of finding a use for it online and not just disposing of it. You know, e even though in the week after we really didn't have a focus, we didn't really know what it was going to be, but after the project came together, you know, we were able to zone in on the exact people we needed 
and use the stuff that we already had and not have to re-interview people unnecessarily, you know, because if we could leave people alone, let's leave them alone, you know. But there were a couple people we had to go back and interview again, like the superintendent, I interviewed her two days later after the tornado on the Wednesday. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't ask lots of questions that we needed to know for the story. You know, I mean, I didn't do that kind of an interview. And to be honest, I probably have never done that kind of an interview. That detailed of a, what did you do very first thing that morning? Like, what did you do before you left the house? What was the last thing you did before you walked out the door? I mean, that I probably have never done that kind of an interview. So we tried to really spare the people that we could and, and use everybody else in a way that was helpful to readers without going back and dragging the nut for everybody else. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Well, one of the things that Phil emphasized to me that I think was really important was to ask people uh, in, in at the various points in their day, as the, as their day unfolded, what were you thinking? Phil said that, you know, several times to me, and and, and it was the best advice that I heard with regard to pulling this kind of story together. Uh, and, and as uh, as time went on, and I interviewed more people, I made a point of asking that question, and it it, it produced uh, uh, a lot of the the more powerful stuff. That, that turned out uh, to make it into the story. And, uh, and like Carrie said, there's a lot of stuff that, uh, that didn't get in. Uh, uh, the, a number of people explained what it was like to be in the hallway uh, as the roof lifted off and the walls started to fall and water started coming out of a sprinkler pipe that broke in the ceiling. And uh, when the final package was done, uh, that was a, a paragraph or two. I, I think it wasn't very much. Uh, and, uh, and that's the way it needed to be. Well, one of the stories of this is, what do you need to leave out in order to make this the best story it can be? Which is kind of almost counterintuitive, but it's, it, it was important in this situation. Yeah, a couple points. You know, I, I think this is a great, this is what you want to have when you marry narrative with the web component. You know, you want them to be complementary, not duplicative. You know, the experience that you got by going online and doing and reading this and, and looking at the interviews and listening to the audio and all that kind of stuff was completely different than what the story was. It was completely different. And that's, I think that's what you want. I mean, you, it's a value added thing. It's, you don't want to repeat what you have in the print product on online. You want to have something that gives them more value. Um, on the on the uh, the issue of what were you thinking? Any good narrative writing, that's the that should always be the question that you're consistently asking again and again and again. You know, the greatest drama plays out between your ears. You know, it's just, it's that internal monologue that goes on in your mind that's interesting. You know, it's what. It's what people, it's, it, you know, yeah, what they're doing is interesting, but what they're thinking is more interesting. It always is. And, and when you're trying to do a narrative, you use the action to propel the story along, but the story isn't the action. The story is about the people and its effect on them and asking them what, the, uh, what that effect is. So that's why you want to consistently, whenever you're going through an interview, and, 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 the, and it is different when you're interviewing for a narrative, they are much more, I mean, I spent, I spent three hours with Jennifer down in our interview, and it was exactly that. What did you have for breakfast that morning? What did you listen to on the radio on the drive in? What did you have for lunch? Um, you know, the fact that she had texted back and forth with her boyfriend was golden, right? I mean, the, the texting, that is such a cool thing that you have now in narrative storytelling to drive dialogue. I mean. You have the time, you have the conversation, you have the exact words, and that's one of the hard things in narrative is dialogue, you know, because you're relying on people's memories and stuff, so you're re often recreating dialogue, and, and a lot of times it loses its impact when you try and do that. So I love that aspect of it, emails, you know, we used a lot of email in this story because it was timely and it was, you know, we knew it would be true and that kind of thing. Um, 
And then the final thing about the, the you know, we did start with 500 inches and, and, you know, killing the babies was something I was taught really young in writing. It's like, you know, you kill the baby, you kill your best stuff, you know, you, you know, I know there's this tendency, I think, when, you, when you're first starting that you think that everything that you've learned, you've got to put in the story, you know, that you've got to empty your notebook into it. And, and the idea is to get all the subtleties and context and all that stuff in your story, but without unloading your notebook into the story. And you can do it, you know, it's the details that you provide, it's the, it's the scenes that you provide and all those, those kinds of things. But, you know, in the end, you want your stories to be stripped to their barest bones. You want people to race from paragraph to paragraph. You want people to, you know, to drive them from paragraph to paragraph. No slow spots, you know. And, and, and we had discussions about that because it's often difficult to do, right? Because you're killing stuff that you know is good. It's good. But in killing it, you're making your stuff better, you know? Because think of what's left when you kill out that stuff. And, I, and I, it's tough to do, but that, those final edits of just cutting it down, cutting it down, cutting it down, and, and that's really important, and that's what makes I think that's what makes it a compelling read, you know, easy to get through. Yeah, so. there, there, there was a benefit to the readers in the end. Yeah. On that same note, um, time, timelines usually aren't, uh, they're interesting, but they're not always as, um, they don't always feel like if you're reading a story. It's just like a, another element. What you all did was you created a timeline that was a narrative. It, you were telling a story, and you had to have done an awful lot of, you said, going back and cutting and cutting and cutting. How much of that, tell us a little bit about how you, you, you managed the story after you had all the information and it was written. Uh, how much going back and forth was involved between all three of you, or was was it one person's job to to, to do that? Well, again, how we start. How, I think the the what I would call the skeleton of that story was the interview with Jennifer Doan, and what I did was, you know, I interviewed her, uh, and how I like to do my interviews is chronologically. I always start with, let's start at the beginning. Tell me, tell me the story from the beginning. And I make that person during the course of an interview stick to the chronology. And if they start jumping ahead in the story, I say, whoa, 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 you're getting ahead of me. Stick to the chronology. It helps me. My, my notes are organized better that way. They've told me the story in a chronological way. It's, the, it's how we think. I mean, it's, it's how we're built. It's, we think chronologically. We want stories to un, unwind over a timeline. So, um, you know, you, you you try and keep it on that timeline. So we did the interview with Jennifer Doan. I came back and I basically wrote out her story in, in a timeline over the course of that day, where she was, what she'd done, what she was thinking, what she'd texted. And then w as we conducted more interviews, I would tell these guys, and we set it up in a Google Drive document so that we could all have access to it. And I said, as you do your interviews, here's the framework. Here's the times. Here's what we know happened at this. Put your scene that you think is good, or you know whatever it is, wherever you think it goes in the story, wherever you think the time is right that this happened. And keep in mind, we're just trying to say, what were you doing at this time? So it was easy. We had a time. So then that's how we ended up with 500 inches of essentially scenes and anecdotes and quotes and stuff. And so it, it then became, okay, what is superfluous? What can go? You know, how do we keep reader interest? Where does it bog down? And some of that is just reading it and reading it and reading it and cutting it and cutting it and cutting it um, to what you, you know, to what seemed, and we were passing it back and forth, you know, and they were, making comments and I was making comments and can we keep this, can we, you know, cut that. Um. 
I wanted to say something about the timeline structure of it. I think that this timeline was particularly useful in this story because everyone knows the ending. And everybody knows what's coming. And everybody knows kind of what time it was. You know, everybody knows where this story's going. You know, I think there's, I think in a way, even though you know the ending, that sort of builds suspense and it drives to the end. You know, because you know the horrible ending. And, and I'm pretty sure that we wrote about it in the top, too. So I think a timeline isn't always going to, you know, it's not really great for most narratives most of the time. But I think in this scenario, you know, everybody in our readership area knows what is coming. You know, and I think that that is what made the timeline element of it so effective because everybody knows the end. And various people would uh, uh, appear in the narrative uh, along the way. It, it started out with Jennifer Doan, I guess, right at 5.30 in the morning when she got up. But, but uh, other uh, minor characters, I guess you would call them, uh, appear in the story at different points along the way. And for me, at least, uh, I begin to wonder, I, I wonder when, when they appear, what's going to happen to them? Because they've got, you know, there, there's a uh, there's a climax to the story for each individual, and, and uh, uh, are they going to get hurt? Are they going to uh, uh, this what, this one guy uh, that I talked to turned out to be the guy who climbed into the pile of rubble and held onto Jennifer Doan's hand, which was something that she had mentioned, and. Uh, so that guy shows up early, earlier in the story with his kids, uh, but as you read, you find out that he's the guy that held her hand. And, and to me, and, and that was a really powerful part of the way the thing unfolded for me and, and the way the story was told. Which was, which was serendipity, because there was this photograph of Jennifer Dunn. It's, it's, it's that kind of iconic photo of her with the rubble over her head, and she's just kind of raising up out of the, after being rescued. And there was two firefighters sitting there, and I just became obsessed early on with like, I gotta find that firefighter, I gotta find that firefighter, you know. And I, and uh, so the first one, the first firefighter, they said that he didn't really want to talk with the press, but there was a second firefighter in the picture, and they, he, you could see his tattoo on his arm. And she goes, oh, that's so and so, you know. So I go out and I interview this guy, and he ended up being a great interview and stuff, and really nice guy. And we're talking at the end of it, and I go, yeah, that that picture of you is just amazing. He's like, well, what picture? And I'm like that picture of you helping Jennifer Doan out, you know? And he's like, and I show it to him, he's like, that's not me. And he has a tattoo that looks exactly like the guy in the picture. He goes, that's, that's another guy from our department. He goes, I'm, I'm down at the other end. And it was like, I still used him. He still was great. And he ended up being the guy that was pulling out the dead bodies as opposed to the live bodies and stuff. But I, I'm sitting there for an hour thinking I'm interviewing the guy that is gonna rescue Jennifer Doan and ends up it's not him, but. Uh, Anyway, worked him into the story anyway. But, um, you know, I, there's things about this story that I'm going to disagree one thing about, you know, f for me, timelines and narratives work. I mean, it's how, it, it's not always necessarily, you know, sometimes it's, it's being in a, 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 a drive with somebody or telling a story. You know, you need a vehicle sort of propel the story along. And whether it's a road trip, or whether it's a, uh, you know, y you need something that's driving the narrative. You know, you need to have, um, you know, I'm trying to work on one now about some National Guard soldiers, you know, and it's the story of their mission. You know, it's the story of their tour. Uh, it's, and it is a timeline that's going to carry scenes over the, the course of their, you know, of, of what happens to them over time. So. I don't know, it just works for me. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a gifted enough storyteller to do the circular storytelling and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm really comfortable doing linear storytelling. It, to me, it's just the easiest way to do it. How did you get to all these people? Who'd you go to first to, to find who you needed to talk to? I'll just talk about how we got to a majority of people at first, and then you guys can talk about how you got to your sources. Um, for the, When it comes to getting people from more, um, it really goes back to relationships. And um, 
this is going to sound crazy, but whenever I was a f reporter right out of college, I covered Moore Public Schools and the city of Moore. And they remembered me and they liked me, you know, that, that I was a fair reporter and that I wasn't a jerk or whatever, you know. And they talked to me. They agreed to my interview requests. And so when I went and got to interview the superintendent, um, I asked, can we come to the, the reunion celebration of uh, when they got the, the kids and the teachers back together from Plaza Towers? And yeah, it was Thursday after the tornado. And they said yes. And that's because they knew me and they trusted me from nine years ago. And no, when, we, when we got to go, I said, you know, can I bring a photographer with me? And it ended up being a team of six of us, um, a photographer and friends. And um, they let a, a reporter and photographer from the world, and they let a TV guy from News 9, and that was it. Nobody else got to go. Um, and that's because the world and News 9, they, other people found out that we were going to go, and so they let them go too. But when we got to go to, the, to that school, you know, they weren't letting anybody in. They hadn't told the police officer yet that we were going to be allowed to go in. And so he was making us stand across the street. And we were there with like Inside Edition and like CNN, all these other TV stations from out of town. And it was, I'm not gonna lie, when we walked across the street, I felt so smug. I was just like, <laughs> yes, we're going in, ha, stay there. But I, it was really because I, I had done a fair job covering them, you know, so many years ago. And they knew that we were going to be respectful and that we were going to do a good job this time. And so that when we went to that when we went to that reunion event and it was two hours long, we got a, a huge bulk of interviews. And they also then they invited us to another party that they have for kids, and I couldn't go, but Sarah and Carmen went, and they they trusted us to do that, and we got so many great interviews that way because they knew that we weren't gonna just be terrible, you know, that we were gonna be respectful of them. So I think that that was a great end for us, you know, and that's how we got the principal and the superintendent, the two people I was in charge of for the story, and I mean that for, so for my experience for that, it really went back to being a good reporter forever ago. So like, it feels like it doesn't, pay off, you know, even though I only covered them for like a year, but they remembered that. So it, relationships you build really matter, so. My experience was uh, much different than that. Uh, I, um, I got up on Wednesday morning, the tornadoes at, at uh, 3.30, 3.20, 3.30 on, on Monday afternoon. I got up on Wednesday morning, I live in Norman, uh, and there was an email from, uh, I think it was from Brian Mon, who's a District 2 County Commissioner. And he said, if anybody wants to go in the tornado zone, somebody from District 2 will take you. Well, this turned out, and, and, and I think I just sort of said yes, you know, without really even consulting with anybody. Where do I meet you? And I, I, so I went to meet their crew up by the Home Depot on 19th Street. Uh, it turned out the guy who uh, took me around that morning is named Chris Calvert. His wife is named Shelly, and she's a second grade teacher at Plaza Towers in the, in the hallway. Yeah. And, and I, I, upon reflection, I told my wife and, and other people that I, I think that Chris wanted to go back because his wife almost got killed. Uh, but anyway, he said, he pulled up in front of Plaza Towers and said, this is Plaza Towers. It's the first time I'd seen it. He said, you want to go in? I said, yeah. And uh, so we went in. We went in the hallway. He showed me the classrooms. He showed me where the walls had been that had fallen down, stuff like that. And uh, uh, then he drove me around some more. And about noon or 1230 that afternoon, uh, 
we were going down this street and I said, stop, you know, do you mind stopping so I can interview somebody who uh, uh, is cleaning up their house? And, and I just got out of the truck and I started talking to these people. Well, it turned out the person that I was talking to uh, has a son Whose, girl, whose girlfriend was in their house when it was destroyed by the tornado. But then I find out later that uh, the, the son's mother is the treasurer of the Plaza Towers PTA. And so I called her and, and, and said, can, can you help me reach some people? And she put me in contact with a woman who's the president of the Plaza Towers PTA, whose name is Aileen Sorrells. And I gave her a list of people that we wanted to talk to when I interviewed her on a Thursday night. And I got a call about noon on Saturday from somebody who said, I can meet you if you want to, if you want to do an interview. And then I got another call uh, within about, I think an hour of that or so, uh, from somebody else who said, I can meet you. So I went to the La Quinta Inn in Moore on Saturday afternoon and went in the empty dining room and interviewed these two people. And, uh, and then, how did we find Steve Bokoff? I have to think about that. I'll, I'll leave it there. But anyway, the, it was sort of serendipity. I mean, I, I literally, I just said, stop. I want to talk to these people because they're coming through this house that is like gone, except for a gun cabinet, which, which was the only thing standing. And, uh, and they turned out to have a relationship to Plaza Towers, which a lot of people in that neighborhood had. You know, and, and then it led from one thing to another, and, and people led. Uh, and, and the interviews led us to people who were in the hallway that day. Yeah, I'm lazy. I just relied on the list that we were smart enough to put together, somebody was, when we started the tornado coverage, and somebody said we should write down all the numbers of people that we encounter. And it was amazing how many people were on that list that had kids that were lost or were in that hallway. Um, that's how I found several of the people I talked to. Um, so, I mean, that worked for me, and uh, as far as a couple things, I think a lesson we learned, I knew it and we should have remembered it, is like get everything the first time. I know you think you're going to go back and interview them a second time or they're going to have, but uh, like we had an experience with, you know, photographs and stuff, you know, if they offer them to you the first day that you have a chance to get them, take them, because don't give them a chance to reconsider that thought. Um, or if you think that you're going to get another bite at this apple, don't count on it. A lot of times after people do these traumatic interviews in these situations, they realize I'm not, I'm not going to do that again. That once was enough. You know, if you didn't get it, I'm sorry. Um, so that would be another important lesson that I think we learned about. And then, um, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that you know, I think you always set out with the idea that you're going to get everybody and tell the complete story, and you're never going to get everybody, and you're never going to tell the complete story. You know, you have to tell the story that you find. And, you know, at a certain point, I think we sort of had to cut it off and realize we're not getting any more of these people. You know, we're not going to have any more parents or anything like that. So we got to make do with what we have. Um, and so, you know, that, that's another lesson that I think you learn. You're, you're not going to get everything you think you're going to get. Um, uh, that I noticed uh, referring to that, that, that process, people started telling us kind of the same story also. Uh, stories started kind of lining up and uh, uh, being somewhat consistent, although there were you know, in inconsistencies like we talked about before. But it, uh, for me at least, it started to get a little bit repetitive. P people seem to have generally the same experience. Uh, uh, and it, where the details differed, you know, and where they got up that morning and where they drove from and stuff like that differed, but their experience in the school during the tornado was uh, similar, you know, uh, among different people. So I don't think we lost a lot by not interviewing every last person. Uh, and, and some of them didn't want to. Uh, Shelly Calvert, for instance, uh, talked to me two days after the uh, uh, the tornado, and it was a great interview, although I didn't, at that point, ask the right questions. I didn't say, you know, what did you do, where did you get up, you know, where were you, what did you listen to on the radio this morning when you got up, and so on and so forth. She started telling me the story 
from about 10 till 3, which was when they started taking tornado precautions in the school. And uh, I tried to go back to her for more, and she didn't want to talk. And eventually, it took me a week, but eventually the word got back to me that she just didn't want to talk about it anymore. I have two questions. Um, one is kind of a comic. I mean, I still get, I just feel tense, even just y'all talking about it. And I read the story at least three times in, in editing it, and it still is just, you know, it's one of those really powerful stories. And I think, now, Carrie, does that have anything to do <laughs> with you becoming a teacher? <laughs> but that's not my, my question. I wanted to know how y'all felt about how it turned out and how it was presented, if, if, it, uh, if it met your expectations and if you had a good feeling about it or if it's hard to not keep going back and think, I wish we could have done this, I wish we could have done if this. If you think that if turning it in at 10 o'clock on Friday morning, I'm going to complain about how it was presented, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I think the presentation was fine. I think, you know, I mean, given the limitations that we gave them in terms of no time, um, you know, I think it turned out real well. I, you know, I, the next morning, you know, I got the bulldog and read it and, you know, spotted a couple of little, like, minor things, like, um, you know, I had left in a quote late in the story, and, and there were no quotes in that story. There was, there were no quotes in that story. The only quotes that were in that story were if they were said in time. Um, and that was something that, you know, one of the difficult things is you have three people who all have ideas about story approach and you know what you're doing and everything and we all have three separate ideas right I mean we're all functioning in different and so it's sort of uniting those th three different styles and trying to sort of okay let's this is what we're looking for this is you know we we're not doing a news story where we're gonna have quotes and stuff like that that's not what we're gonna have here you know, if, if you know, it's, again, it's, it's what's happening in their mind, not what they're saying. And so if you go, and so what I found late that next morning, looking through it, was oh, I'd left a quote in, so I called the desk and said, hey, we need to change that and just make it into a statement, not a quote. And that was fine. I thought at one point that I wondered if we could have used a um, cast of characters box with the list of, you know, with photos of the various characters because for me, I always think this, whenever you have a story that has a lot of players in it, um, it's so much easier for the reader, and I think the mind so much more quickly identifies if you have a picture of that person, once they see that picture, they can read that story, and just by glancing back at that picture, they know exactly who it is, everything that you've written about, as opposed to making them go back and find the name in the story and remember who that person was. I just think it's this visual reference point that makes you remember, oh, that's that character, that's that character. So I think it might have been nice to have that, but at the same time, I don't, I'm not sure we had pictures of everybody that we would have needed to do that. Um, and that was, you know, I mean, we were scrambling at the end, too. Um, I think the last minute change was the name of the story, which I loved. I, I, I loved the name change that they ended up with. I, I thought that was really, and I think that was Kelly that came up with that idea, if I remember, but it was a great idea. And um, There was a lot of secondary writing that had to go on. Um, there was a lot of um, minor things that you don't really think about that have to be written and that have to be good. Um, for example, on that was on the second page, the first jump, um, all of the pictures of the kids. Um, on Friday, it was really important to me that we not just have their names. So I went and read their obituaries and their, um, the stories we'd written about them and wrote a sentence for each kid that I thought their parents would uh, like. And that was the hardest writing that I have ever had to do. I'm not kidding that was really really hard and I felt like it was really really important and that's not that's something that's not part of the story but it's part of the presentation and it's important you know and it's just something that you don't really always think of as needing to go into a large-scale package like this but it's also very important um, another thing is the graphic 
um, that took a lot of time. And of course, like our graphics people were awesome, coordinating all of that and getting all of you know the chatter up top and figure out figuring out what needed to be highlighted, um, because you know like we were talking about, not everybody remembers everything exactly the same way. Not everybody remembers where everybody was in exactly the same place. Figuring out what exactly needs to be on there, and that you know is huge and takes a lot of back and forth. There were probably six versions of that graphic. So that's a lot of, there's a lot of that kind of stuff that can be very detail oriented and time consuming, but it really pays off because I think it really adds to the presentation overall and it gives the reader all of that, like Phil was talking about, the value added, like it just gives you more, you know, when you really can look at it and visualize it. And um, so that, that kind of stuff can be time consuming, but it's, but it pays off. Two thoughts. Uh, one, which I've written down on my hand because I didn't bring a piece of paper. Um, what Phil said about the quotes, I, I fought, and, you know, like we didn't come to blows or anything like that. But I kept saying, how come this can't be a quote? And it took me a long time to understand what we were doing, I think, in that regard. Uh, and I think it, 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 he, he had a clarity of vision that, that was beyond my ability to understand, and, and it was the right decision. But I, I thought I had these great quotes, you know, and, and stuff, and I'm going like, why can't we quote these people? And so we paraphrased, I, I think, a lot, or we just used their words, really, but without quote yeah, marks around them. You'd bring them out of time. Right, right. You know, if you quoted them in the present, you'd be bringing them out of time in the story, which that you couldn't do that. This was a time, you know, story in time. Right. Uh, one yeah. of the things I, oh, one other thing real quick, <laughs> uh, this reminded me of one thing. Everybody that I, 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 the people that I interviewed, hour and a half or two hours, uh, usually on all of them, and it was important to go into depth because it might be an hour and 15 minutes before you got to the thing that you ended up using and that, that made the story what it was. But another thing I did, and it was really important in this situation, and I started uh, sort of inadvertently with Shelley Calvert on Wednesday night, I made everybody draw a map for, for me. Where were you? What did you do? What did you see? Draw arrows on, you know, write down who was in this room, who was in this room, who was in this room. Draw me arrows about where you climbed out over the, over the rubble to get out. Draw me arrows where people who you saw came into the hallway. Draw me, show me how you got out, show me how the kids got out, and so on and so forth. And, and, and I think I had about five, five or six different maps by the time I was done. And that also helped us picture what happened there in our minds so that we could tell the story. Go ahead. I was just going to say one of the other things I thought helped a lot, because I knew this was a dense, there was a, so much, was the fact that we could break it up by these times. And I thought we got to keep every one of these short. And I just think that made it accessible. You know, it just made it, um, it, it hey, if I can get through the next two paragraphs, that's only two paragraphs. And then the thought was, hopefully that last paragraph makes you want to read the next paragraph. So I think just the, the layout and the way that we broke it up like that, I think really helped a lot too. It didn't ask a lot of the reader, I don't think. And then, uh, I think another thing, can we flip to, to, to the next page? I think one of the things you find when you look at it is that when you get, uh, keep going to like the next, yeah, like right in here, you get to this part, and they start to get longer when the as the tornado is hitting the building, you know, and 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 you have more people talking about what was happening to them as the building is being destroyed, and and it, it, for me, for it to sort of build to that, and then and then hit that, and and go into deeper detail at that point uh, with people and different people all come together at that point. Uh, and, and that's a really dramatic moment in the story, and I think that was important. Okay, I probably...
Um, there was a lot of information, um, especially when it came to the vignettes, and you know, only only three of them ended up in the paper, um, and they were all these three, and they were all people that were in the hallway, um, and people that just didn't necessarily fit into the narrative, but were still there. But in um, you know, when we when when you track that many people. Um, I brought this as an example of um, being a nerd. Um, but there's a lot of information to track for everybody. And so this is, this is like, okay, so where is everybody in the, where is that person in the building? Who is their teacher? The room number, which we didn't find out until later. If we had art, if we had video, how long is it? If it's going to go in print, which obviously very few of them did, but we didn't know, you know, at the time if any would or if they all would or whatever. And that's something that has to be shared with everybody, you know, because especially, especially the online people. And that's one thing that I think that we kind of struggled with was bringing the online people in earlier because, and getting that copy through earlier because, you know, all of that takes time. It's not just like copy, paste, and done. <laughs> you know, especially with what they did. Um, because if you look at all of this, everything that they did, I mean, it's just awesome. They put together all these slideshows. I mean, they just, they did all of it. And that was basically like saying, oh God, there's our homepage. <laughs> um, but basically in the very beginning saying like, here's like our dream project. Like what could we do if we want to have all of these things? And um, Nick Tankersley is the one who came, like we said we wanted a map, you know, and he's the one that came up with like the sketch without it being too childish, you know, because this now is not the time for backwards ease and things like that. But like, like still being like childlike, but not silly. And um, so it, it was about like, as soon as we knew about things to start talking to all the, I mean, cause you, especially like at the length, the length for it, you know, when, it's, when we started the 500, you have to like immediately go and apologize to the copy desk for what's about to happen um, and ask for that kind of space. Um, we said 75, it was a lie. Um, so that was, that was a big part of it, is like just like, even if there, you don't have everything yet, just to like put it on people's radar and let them know that it's coming. Um, because people are a lot more willing to help you if they know something's happening than if you just show up, you know, on a Wednesday before it's the Sunday it's running and say, hey, I have like 18 hours of work for you to do. Could you do that right now? Okay, thanks. So it's all about collaborating. The, uh, um, uh, I, I think, started thinking visually with the maps, and, and I'm, I'm guilty to a great extent because Carrie or somebody else would say to me as I was going out the door to do an interview, don't forget to take a picture of the person you're interviewing. I get so wrapped up in the interviews that I, I, I would, you know, part ways with whoever it was and get in the car and I go, ah, oh, jeez, I didn't take a picture. Uh, and we were able to, to get a picture, you know, by email or something like that in, in a couple of cases, but uh, I could have done a better job in that regard, I think, than I did, although the maps did help, I think. I was just kind of, we did meet like uh, three weeks before publication with, you know, photo and I think video was there and whoever else, graphics, I think, to say, okay, here's what we're going to try and do. We don't, mm, trying to think who all was there. Probably not. Probably not. Well, because you said something at the early on that I that I've kind of found a little counterproductive for me sometimes. Uh, you said when you set them down for an interview, you ask right off the bat to go through cr chronologically. I've always had a lot better luck, kind of letting them, you know, what gush forth with what what the the thing that they remember the most, most vivid to them first, and then backing up and going chronologically after they've had a chance to to give them me their most visual memorable descriptions because I found that if I go directly into the chronologically sometimes I get them talking mechanically 
which screws up my interview, but uh, I just wanted to hear what your thoughts were. I was just going to say, I think by the time that you get to that interview, you know what that is, because you've had the conversation with them a little bit, and I don't disagree with what you're saying. You know, usually the first thing they say, and this is a, another Reporter 101 thing, you know, it's that climb up on the bar stool next to me and tell me a story. People are naturally inclined storytellers. Typically the way they tell you a story is a great way to tell the story, right? I mean. We are programmed that way. We lay out something that sucks you in to want to stay and listen to our story. We give you just a few enough details. You know, we don't give you everything right off the bat. You know, we're natural born storytellers. And you're right. The first thing that those people are going to tell you are the things that hit them or most important to them or their most emotional, you know, touch points and stuff like that. I just mean more when you're going for that in-depth interview for a narrative story, for me, it helps. Um, and, and yes, I mean, if they get to a point and they want to go off on it and, you know, I, I'm, you know, f but, but I'm just going to say for me, it works better if I keep them sort of going down that line. And we, you know, we different styles. Uh, well, one of the things that I found in looking back at, at the interviews that I did was that some people, well, first of all, uh, a lot of these people wanted to talk and they felt well, it, it seemed as though they felt a need to talk. Um, and and so I, I can think of a couple where uh, they, they told me something, you know, and they just sort of got it off their chest. And then I, I, I said, okay, let's go back to the beginning of the day. Uh, so I, I, I kind of let them talk. Uh, and then uh, when, when the time felt right, and it was, it's really hard to say, you know, other than, you know, this seems like it, uh, this is the right time to do this, I'd say, uh, take me back to when you got up, you know, were, were you thinking about the weather that morning? Uh, uh, what did you hear on the radio? Did you listen to the radio? What station did you listen to on the, on, on the radio as you were coming to work? And, and so kind of guide them. Uh, and. and uh, and, and try to keep them on track after that. But I did find some people just, you know, like, like you said, they, they had something they wanted to say, and then I was able to uh, guide them along from the beginning. And then they told the same story a second time, so it sort of reinforced it and added more detail to that, that moment that they spoke about at first, uh, because they went over it again, and, and that was helpful. There were some people that um, who there were points where it was too much, and I and I personally felt like in this scenario that that was okay, and I didn't, and I you know I don't know if that was the right choice, but I just let it go because I felt like we had enough from other people that if it was too much that was just too much and that was fine, and that that could be a a gap in their timeline for that moment or a or a a part we didn't need that much detail from them. I just felt like that with the bulk of information we had that, that in this scenario there were there were that I just let some stuff go. Maybe I don't know if that was the right choice, but that's what I did. Well one thing I'm thinking about I, I, I went to see Sydney Angle's dad uh, to do a profile in life. Uh, I also went to see Janae Hornsby's dad uh, for the same thing. Uh, first, and, and when I talked to Janae Hornsby's dad, I tried to guide him into that day to see if he would tell me what happened, and he just was not going there at all. Uh, and, and I went to see Dan Angle, having had that experience, and uh, I th and I was thinking I'm just going to you know stick with the stuff about Sydney, get the stuff for a profile of life, uh, and he's you know, I'm not expecting that he's going to want to talk. And he just unloaded, you know, about the day and what happened. I didn't even have to ask him. He just started telling me what had happened to them all the way through 11 o'clock on, uh, it must have been Tuesday morning, when they went to the Baptist church. Uh, they were called to the Baptist church uh, to be told that their daughter had died. And, uh, and, and it was, you know, he started at the beginning and just told me the story. Uh, and, and there was no stopping him, really. It, 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 even, it gives me chills now, just thinking about it. Uh, and now we're probably done, brother. I was going to say, I had Nicholas McCabe's dad do the same thing. I had him on the phone for probably four minutes. 
and um, started talking a little bit, you know, and just was asking him about, you know, when did you, where were you when, when it happened, you know, when did you get to the school? Probably four minutes into the conversation, you know, I could just tell he was getting extremely emotional, and I just said, if this is too hard, we don't need to do this, you know, it's fine with me, it's fine with me, and he's like, yeah, and I said, okay, I appreciate your help. And I took what he'd given me in that four minutes and worked it into the story, and it was really emotional stuff. But I wasn't gonna, you know, I'm not. We're not looking to rehurt these people. So, I did get the one angry letter. So um, I got an a email that came in to the, you know, the big e email box to the paper and it was from um, can't think of his name no it was the little boy the only thing that we had written in the story was that he was not part of Miss Doan's class that he had gotten up at one point to go to the bathroom came back his spot was taken in his own classrooms area and so he sat with Miss Doan's students that was the only thing we said in the story about him and um, not yeah, I think we did use his name. And so she, I got an email from her, or the paper did, and it said, um, it's all lies. Um, that's not what happened to my son. And I can't remember what else she said. And I, I wrote her back and I said, you know, first of all, I want to apologize, you know, um, or I, I'm sorry for your loss. I said, well, you know, we, we try as best we can to be as accurate as we can be. And I said, you know, the, the, you know, the problem uh, that this was a catastrophic event and, the, and what we tried to do is record the memories of the people as best they could recall. I said, you know, and, and that's all I said. And, I, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking in my mind, well, fuck, she doesn't know. She doesn't know what happened to her son in reality, you know. So, you know, I, I took it as sort of an angry mother um, and left it at that. And I, and, oh, I remember the last thing I said was, and we also recognize that some families did not wish to be contacted by the media, and we honored that. And I didn't say you, I just said some families, because they had been one of the families that had refused to talk to the media. And so we didn't reach out to them. You know, I, and maybe that's a mistake. You know, I was gonna mention their son, maybe I should have made one more attempt, but in this sort of sensitivity thing of trying not to re-injure people, how many times they need to say they don't wanna to talk to the media? Do we want to call them up and make them say it one more time? So I just chose not to make that call, you know, and she's never written me back. She's never written me back from my response to her. So, you know, and again, it's, it's memories. And that was, that was one of the other things I wanted to stress was, you know, we put in the opening of this story that these are people's memories. It's not, you know, we don't know that this is all factually this is the best they, and I mean, we do that every day. I mean, this, all the stories we do are that way in a way, but again, these are catastrophic events. People don't remember them the same. And, and what, one of the things Phil said to me as we were, as we were doing it was, uh, as, you, as you write this, so-and-so remembers that they did this or that this happened. Which emphasizes that that point about the this is the memories of the people who were there that day, and as we said, uh, memories differ uh, on on some things. Uh, they they were amazingly consistent in a lot of ways, but they also differed uh, in, in detail uh, in some cases. <coughs> 